There will be no country music if we're in World War III. America is all for you know, good values, country music, and the American flag, and gosh, veterans. Politics is downstream from culture. So whether it's Hollywood or Nashville or whatever, I kept thinking there's got to be a way to get around this huge wall for conservative uh, artists to be heard again. People are sick of the elitism. People are sick of being spoken down to, even if they thought they agreed with it. I don't think it's an overstatement to say that they want something bad to happen to President Trump. We may not all start in the same place, but we can all end in the same place. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the show. You know what to do. Go to where podcasts are offered. Leave a five-star rating and a review. We don't care what you say. Uh, somebody actually left a review the other day. They said something. That was the only thing in the review. And you know what? I'm perfectly fine with that. I mean, you had your one shot. You blew it. You With one word, you could have you could have called me all sorts of things. But uh, I went and checked. You know, even with the crazy cancel culture that's been coming after us lately, we still are a 4.9. After 10 years of podcasting, 4.9 rating, at least with Apple Podcasts. I don't know. But uh, it, it helps us. It really does. If nothing else, it strokes my ego and it helps my vanity. So please... Go and leave those ratings. And if you're watching on Rumble or on YouTube, please smash that like button so that we'll know that you're out there because the throttling is real. Hey, guys, as you know, I travel all over the country. Uh, it's 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 hard work, you know, going out there and doing live shows. It's fun work. Don't get me wrong, but it's work nonetheless. And uh, to go out there and, and, and do that year after year, it's, it's tedious, but it's worth it because we have the opportunity to go out there and share what we do with you without any filters, without any algorithms, without anything in between us, except, well, some of the places I've been probably could have used a little chicken wire because you can get a little wild out there. But it's a lot of fun going out there and being in front of a live audience because we don't have to worry about the filters. And so I want to encourage you, continue going out. <clears throat> And uh, grabbing those tickets and, and finding us, you can go to watchchad.com where all the fun stuff is and find me live out on the road. We've done everything we can in spite of this crazy Bidenflation world we live in to keep our ticket prices as low as possible. In fact, I don't think they've ever changed. We've kept them down. If you're ever out there and you see an expensive ticket price and my name's connected to it, you're on the wrong site. So don't do that. But I want to introduce you, uh, probably a person who needs no introduction, if you're on social media at all and you uh, follow conservative influencers. Uh, here's one that I bet you've seen or are following already, and if not, you're going to be. Uh, she's another person who's out there in front of the live audiences quite a bit, and I'm happy to bring her on the show for the first time. I feel horrible because I've postponed her a couple of times, and I'm a bad friend. But welcome to the show, my friend Alexis Wilkins. Alexis, how are you? Where are you, first of all? I'm doing well. Um, I am in Nashville currently, which doesn't happen that often anymore. So here we are. So Nashville is, is you're an Arkansas girl, right? Yes, I am. Fayetteville. Originally, but Nashville is technically home for when you are home. Is, am I right on that? Yes, exactly. Okay. You know, I was just in Arkansas. We just did a weekend of shows in Little Rock. I'm going back next week oh. to Paragold, Paragold, Arkansas. Love it. And so did so so there in Nashville at the time of this taping, this this will come out a little bit later, but at the time of this taping, uh was was the area where you are affected by Hurricane Helene? Or did it kind no, of get Nash it unscathed? Nashville was okay. Um, you know, East Tennessee, I just my heart is so hurting for them, of course, West North Carolina, everywhere in there. I have friends in Asheville that I haven't heard from mm -hmm. yet. And so, you know, while Nashville was okay, we have a lot of friends out east. Um, and I'm just, you know, I'm I'm worried for them. I'm concerned for the area, and I'm getting the impression that it's a lot worse than news is reporting. Yeah, and and it's, you know, you and I are no strangers to calling out the mainstream media, and this is one of those situations that's a perfect example of how certain aspects of, well, certain stories that regard certain aspects of our country, certain demographics just sort of get buried. They're not important anymore. And that's, that. there's a lot of concerns that I have about the fact that they're not really reporting what's truly happening in regards to this, but it is sad and our prayers are with these people. I know I'm a Georgia boy. Uh, my home, the property I grew up on where my mother and brothers live it, it, and their families it's wiped out. And so oh, we're, God. we're in a bad situation personally. And, you know, you feel helpless with a situation like this because you want to, 
go and, and, and help, but you can't really get into those areas right now without being a bigger problem than, than what you try to solve. But, but about enough about that, enough about, we'll complain about stuff later on. Uh, you, uh, you got, you blew it up. I mean, here recently with your song, I want my country back. Thank uh, you. It, 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 you, you're out there singing, songwriting, performing, putting the videos out there. You're in front of live audiences. Tell me a little bit about, uh, your journey into the music foray, just your kind of how you went into that and, and kind of your progress through that whole deal. Give me a little history. Oh, gosh. All right. So history. Um, I'll give you the short version, of course. You know, don't worry, everyone. We'll do the abridged version. But uh, I started writing when when I was really young. Um, I found that I could do something I loved and something that, you know, I could be good at to raise funds and awareness for things that I believed in. And so for me, um, that turned into working with veterans and being able to have a platform to speak up for them and try and advocate for some of the issues that they run into as I learned, of course, more about them. I've always appreciated history, um, American history, international history. I have a lot of veterans in my family. And so I was always aware of the things that they went through. Um, but getting to work with them, you know, one on one, whether it's writing a song with them to help them work through some of the stories that they still have in their head or you know, things that people don't even think of, like the VA being underfunded or difficult to work with, you know, just all those kind of issues I started to learn about. And so that really became my why of having a platform and moving forward with music. You know, this industry is, as you know very well, Chad, it's very interesting. And mm -hmm. um, and then I kind of ran into the being a patriot thing. And I, I've always believed what I believed. I've never wavered. And, you know, as I was posting flags and I was posting about the things that I was working on, um, I found that people took that as partisan and, you know, labels would be like, hey, we, you know, we really like you, but we need you to be less political. You know, we want to sign you, we want to offer you a deal. And, and if we offer you a deal, we need you to promise that you, you know, won't uh, endorse anybody or become more political than you already are. And of course, for me, you know, I, I'm, I'm just out here posting American flags, the country in which we live and representing country music and country music values. And I think representing the things that I found my audience believes in posting about veterans. Um, and so for me, that was really a deal breaker having, having companies or organizations that funny, even if they agreed with me, um, and like I said, you know, veterans and posting American flag shouldn't be partisan, but they took it yeah. as that. You guys know that I love Patriot Mobile. They are good friends and great patriots. And, you know, they realize that Americans are tired. They're tired and frustrated by the stalling economy, the inflation, the endless wars, the relentless assault on our values. And thankfully, folks over at Patriot Mobile they got your back. You know, they still believe in America. They believe in our Constitution. And I'm so proud over the years to have partnered with them and continue to do it because Patriot Mobile, it, they're on the front lines, man. They're putting their money where their mouth is and they're fighting for the First and Second Amendments, the sanctity of life, our military and first responder heroes. I want you to take a stand with them on conservative causes and put America first by switching over to Patriot Mobile today. You're going to get the same nationwide coverage as the big providers because Patriot Mobile, they offer operate on all three major networks, plus they back their service with a full coverage guarantee. Their 100% U.S.-based customer service team will take care of you. They will find the best plan for your needs. You can keep your number, keep your phone, or you can upgrade, and they'll help. Go to patriotmobile.com slash chad or call them 972-PATRIOT. You do it right now, you get a free month when you use the offer code CHAD. You know I spell it CHAD. Use that offer code and don't get fooled by the other providers pretending to share your values or have the same coverage. They don't, and they can't. So join me. Switch to America's only Christian conservative mobile provider. That's Patriot Mobile. Go to patriotmobile.com slash CHAD. Call them 972-PATRIOT. Get your free month of service today. Use that promo code CHAD. Hang tight. We'll be right back. And, and so I said, that's it. I'm doing this on my own. And I found an audience that appreciates the things that I stand for, appreciates that I stand up for them. And, you know, I think people forget that that's most of America. You know, you want to be cool on the coasts, that's fine. But America is all for, you know, good values, country music and the American flag and gosh, veterans. So um, mm -hmm. I've been really fortunate to find people who resonate with that vision. Of course, the industry, again, as you know, makes it interesting and pretty difficult, especially, you know, being a young female in country music coming up, you, you have a dream, you want to chase it. And just simply believing in this country and wanting to speak about it, making it difficult can be very difficult. Um, but circumventing that and having control over, you know, 
what you put out, putting out a song called I Want My Country Back. You know, I, I don't believe that a label would have let me put that out in the way that I wanted no. to. You know, it's not a, it's not censored patriotism. It's literally, you know, we have Trump in one of the videos. So I think that um, I think that once you find your audience and that's that's kind of kind of what I've tried to do. It's an interesting trend, and and from what you said, I've got a couple of questions. It's it's never polite to ask a lady her age. I know you're in your mid twenties. We'll leave it at that, okay? Yeah. Um, and and as a young lady, uh, in because you're in that prime right there in terms of how Nashville. Let's use Nashville as an example. They you're in the prime area of of where they start looking for artists to be. I mean, you you should be coming into your own, so they say. Um, it's a hard decision to, to follow your convictions. It, it's not in the moment. In the moment, what I have found, and you, correct me if I'm wrong with you, like for me, it was like, okay, in this moment, I'm going to say this because this is the right thing to say, or this is the right thing to post, or this is the right position to take. Looking back on it, you were like, I, you know, I don't know that I felt bold by doing that. I just felt like it was the right thing for me to do. Yeah. And then you have people who say, man, you could be a lot further along if you'd have just shut your mouth. Um, do you ever look at that and go, well, maybe I should have just been put put career in front of politics or culture? Do you ever do you ever look back with any regret at all? No, not at all. You know, for me, especially where things have gone, um, speaking up is so important. And this country, you know, we're not going to have an industry of music if we're in World War III. I mean, it sounds dramatic, but that's just the truth. You know, it, it, it is what it is. And so for me, speaking up was, um, I guess in the moment, not a huge decision, just because simply, like you said, it's the right thing. And the right thing and the easy thing aren't always the same thing, but you got to say it, you got to do it. And I think for me also, you know, Posting flags and posting veterans and saying I love America, posting on the 4th of July and 9-11, you know, these things shouldn't be big career-altering decisions. And I found out after the fact that, you know, in fact, they were. But yeah. um, it was never a, you know, oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that then. You know, it's funny. I've had huge stars that are huge in this industry that are, in fact, very publicly patriotic say to mm -hmm. me, you know, maybe I would have like, I would have maybe waited until you had a, you know, you made all your money and had a huge platform to come out as patriotic. And for me, that was um, not disheartening for my path or my, my story, because I'm, I'm really proud of the things that I've said. And I think that I wouldn't do anything different. But it was disheartening to think that it was a career altering decision to someone who is even speaking out about this. You know, they agree, they think it's this important and they even say, you know, maybe I'd wait. And so I've never had even a pang of regret. You know, I think that mm -hmm. having a platform, having the ability to explain to people, you know, what's what. And I went to college for business and political science at the same time as having a country music career. This is something that I feel I can educate people on influence young minds on. And, you know, politics is downstream from culture. I say it all the time, mm -hmm. and you probably know this well, that when people are standing shoulder to shoulder at a concert, they're not thinking about the politics involved. You know, there's an essence of unity there. Um, but the conglomerates at the top certainly want to push people in a direction based on the music and the stars that they're promoting. So for me, I probably wouldn't have been the right candidate to compromise my values in other ways anyway. So I'm going to be me and I'm going to yeah. speak out about the things that I believe in. You're bold and I like that. And and I'll tell you, you bring up a good point about you could start at the beginning with it and, and, and use that to, for your trajectory and what I mean by that, like I asked Rachel Holt with Based Records, Chris Wallen and all them, when she came out with the song, I Was Gonna Be, which is very clearly a pro-life song, I said, well, that was a bold move. You know, I asked the record label, I said, are you sure you want to put her out there with that as her very first single? Because that's going to mark her forever. She's the pro-life girl, right? Because that's just, they paint you into the corner. Versus, and I, and I don't know, maybe that's the right way to do it. Do it like, I did it, you did it, where we come out from the beginning. This is where we stand. Because I was just with Brian Kelly from Florida Georgia Line last weekend. I hung out yeah. at his place for for the weekend. And, and he's come out. But again, you know, he's already made his $25 million, right? He already had Florida Georgia Line and, and a whole pile of hits. Jason Aldean came out. 
sometimes I wonder if Jason really wanted to, or if it was Brittany really kind of pushing him <laughs> more, but, but, you know, Jason's pretty outspoken and he's a quiet guy, but he's, he's pretty outspoken about his convictions. So yeah. I, I give him a hard time about that, but I, he truly does believe it. John Rich. So I'm, I'm bringing up these people who have uh, made it, so to speak. And then they, then, then their, their politics sort of surface. So I don't know. I, I I never know what's the right pattern. It should you should you make it big and then do it? I, for me, that wasn't an option. You know, I, yeah. I just had to in this polarizing wild world we live in. I just had to speak up because, as you said so eloquently, uh, there will be no country music if we're in World War Three. So yeah. that's that's a that's a solid solid point right there. I mean, that's profound. Hey guys, you ever stare at a stack of bills that are sitting there on your kitchen counter and you think to yourself, "Man, I, I earned plenty of money. How can I be this far in debt still?" Well, I want to remind you that thanks to COVID and some record inflation numbers, one in four Americans have maxed out their credit cards, and now. You're so trapped in debt, there seems to be no way out, and you just expect that's going to be your way of life. But listen, uh, there there may be a way out, and it's with better debt solutions, and here's why. Because not all, uh, not all debt settlement companies are created equal. Better Debt Solutions has saved clients over $1.5 billion. That's $1.5 billion with a B dollars. Uh, and um, that that's, I mean... That's a ton of money, man. Better Debt Solutions has fast-acting strategies designed to put money back into your pocket month one if you qualify for their program. So you need somebody to stand between you and the bill collectors to stop the threats and the harassing calls. I know you're sick of them, and you can stop it with Better Debt Solutions. Uh, those folks and their partners are going to implement your personalized plan with one main goal, and that's to reduce your credit card and personal loan debt. But listen, some of those strategies are time sensitive, so you need to move quickly. That means now. I want you to get in touch with them. Better Debt Solutions, you can trust them to help settle your debt faster and easier than you thought possible. So I want you to visit Better Debt now.com slash chad for your free consult consultation better debt now.com slash chad one more time that's better debt now.com slash chad yeah we're just not you gonna know. have we're not gonna have any time for that um yeah no. it's and it's an interesting thing because i feel like when you you know i always joke when you come out as a patriot you have like this headline moment where it's you know it, it's at least something that comes out that you can speak on. And when you kind of do it from the beginning, that's just who you are. You know, you don't, you don't yeah. have the headline moment where it's like, Oh, Hey, you know, now so-and-so is a Patriot. And so I don't know what the, you know, what the right way to do it is. But for me, um, I think it was a lot of timing because mm -hmm. I was supposed to go, you know, I was one of the openers on Chris Young's tour before it was shut down because of COVID. So, yeah. you know, I was supposed to go out and do half that tour with him. And, um, I don't think I don't know if I've ever said that on an interview, but because of COVID and because of the agencies and because of some of the mandates, you know, I, it just wasn't something that moved forward for me in a way that made sense when they all picked it back up back out in, you know, 2022 or whenever the reschedules were, you know, things change. And um, and I think COVID affected a lot of people. So that was going on for me, you know, where. I was either having tours canceled because of the pandemic or I wasn't able to go out on them after they reopened because of all the mandates and the government mandates and all that stuff. And then there was this other avenue where I was in college at the same time. And like I said, business and poli sci. And I got an F in comparative politics by a super liberal mm. professor that, you know, I wasn't, I was spoken up about my opinion, but I wasn't out here, you know, yelling in the back of class, making myself heard. He was just aware that I wasn't being indoctrinated like the rest of the students. And that's what it is, is it's systematic, systematic indoctrination. And when he could tell that I was kind of a defector of that, um, he wasn't having it. And so he gave me an F, totally unfounded, didn't put any grades in the system, um, didn't have any really good reason for it, wasn't answering when I had asked why. You know, I had a couple other friends that were on the on some of the sports teams that got D minuses who agreed with me but knew they couldn't be failed because of the sports team. So it was a whole thing. You know, long mm. story short, I ran it up the flagpole, took it to the dean, took it to the dean of the department, eventually made it to the um, president of the school, Bob Fisher. And he said, no, you, you, you've been discriminated against and we're going to, you know, we're going to remedy this. And of course, tenured professors, you can't do anything about the professor, but they ended up correcting the grade, which is good for me. But the amount that you have to go to just to get that corrected, you know, all of these things happening at once. When I came out with my song Stand, which was really 
my line in the sand of, hey, this is what I believe. You know, we have a line in it that says you can kneel anytime you'd like, but I'll never do the same. Um, that was it. And so that was a decision that I knew had gravity, but never gave it a second thought. That's amazing. I, that's, that's an amazing, the fact that you went through that is sad and tragic that you even had to do all of that is a mess. You know, here's what I think, Alexis here. Like I've been sitting back watching. So I was in Hollywood for a little while. I was in LA. I was represented out of LA and management and agency I was writing for sitcoms. I was pitching sitcoms, meeting with all the networks, you know, from the comedy side of my career. I was meeting with all the networks and I was completely ousted because they knew who I was. They knew that I was an outspoken conservative. And it was at a time when the country was really loving the the resurgence of Roseanne and mm -hmm. Tim Allen's Last Man Standing. They were really clamoring for conservative values or traditional values comedy. So we were pitching those ideas and man, we just got shut down. So I said to my manager who'd had, you know, 50 years in the Hollywood industry, I said, is there a way to tear this wall down? And he said, nope, there's no way to tear the wall down. And so whether it's Hollywood or Nashville or whatever, I kept thinking there's got to be a way to get around this huge wall for conservative uh, artists to be heard again. Isn't it interesting that now we see the stuff going on with Diddy being exposed and that whole network that will something happen from that? I don't know. But I do start to see that wall start to get chipped away. And I think it's making it a way for people in the mainstream entertainment industry, as we've mentioned some earlier, uh, all the way down to folks like you and me who are, who are kind of scraping and clawing and using every sphere of influence that we can to get our stuff out there. I think that maybe that wall's getting chipped away at. Do you think anything will come from all of these revelations with Diddy or whoever else that, that maybe people will see behind the curtain and, and just see all that crap for the facade that it is? Have you ever thought about that? I have. And I think it's a I think it's a really relevant point right now. I think that especially with everything going on economically, you know, people are hurting. Especially we have this mm -hmm. natural disaster that's just happened that's absolutely terrible. You know, people are having to come face to face with a lot of real life right now. And I think that looking at the celebrity endorsement culture, you know, the John Legends of the world, the Diddies of the world, the people that, you know, sit in their towers and look down and say, you need to vote for this person when they probably couldn't even tell you what a gallon of gas costs. It's getting old yeah. for people. And I think people who might have agreed with them, even in 2020, maybe you voted in, for Biden in 2020. And I, I, honestly, I think that now that culture is breaking down that wall that you talk about. I think that it's it's breaking from the bottom and the top. You know, the bottom because people are sick of the elitism. People are sick of being spoken down to even if they thought they agreed mm -hmm. with it. And from the top with all the Diddy stuff, you know, I think the Diddy list is going to be just as relevant, if not more relevant now than even the Epstein list. Um, and right. I hope that all of that comes out in the wash. You know, I really hope that people get to see everything that we've kind of heard whispers of for years. You know, I knew that mm -hmm. when I was spending time writing and songwriting in LA, there were groups of people that I didn't want to go write with because I knew what would be asked of me. There were executives that I didn't want to meet with alone, both in Nashville and in LA, because I knew what um, what what they would expect. And so I think that all these things, these whispers we've heard for years, the people involved, um, how tied together everything really is, I, I think that it's starting to fall. And I think that it's going to come all in one big, one big wave. I don't think it's going to keep being these dribbles. You know, at some point, they're going to have to do discovery on this Diddy stuff. And I don't think it's going to yeah. be good for anyone who's been really um, sucking money out of the machine based on their own degenerate values. So, yeah. Nobody ever invited me to any parties. And I know I'm a pretty man. I know. I know they wanted me at their parties. I never got invited to anything. Hey, I so mean, they, they would have loved you there. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, they might have. They they might have. The the fear that I had, Shy, is I don't know if I might have liked it back. You don't know. You don't know till you're in that situation. <laughs> and so you're telling me Taylor Swift didn't influence your vote. Taylor Swift and her endorsement of Kamala Harris did not influence you one way or another. No, it did not. It really did not. I found it fell a little flat for me. Um, you know, it just it really I thought about it and I just went, you know, I'm really considering this. It turns out, wait, I don't care. 
<laughs> and I it's think amazing that, how that works. Yeah. yeah, I think that the celebrity endorsement thing, you know, I, I think I think that they put a lot of weight into that in the last month of the election. And I hope that that's a little a, a bulk of their plan, because I don't people I don't think people care right now. You know, I no. think that they're they're looking at national security. They're looking at the economy and they're going. I don't think that I care. And I think that it affected everyone a lot less. You know, I, I saw that one poll, or I think a couple polls that said that her likability actually went down instead of mm -hmm. um, Trump's, which I thought was pretty funny. So I was watching uh, a clip that someone posted uh, of the Georgia Alabama game from this last weekend. And um, try not to bring that game up as a Georgia fan. I went to Georgia Try not to bring that up, but uh, it's heartbreaking. I know. Thank you. <laughs> hey, I'm Thank an Arkansas you. fan, so, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know what? And I was doing the show in Arkansas that night, so we had to call the pigs and call the hogs, whatever it is y'all do. Love uh, it. But, and I, th I wanted them to win uh, that that night. And I shouldn't say that in Texas because they were playing Texas A&M, and I'll get a lot of people mad at me. But Hey, I appreciate it. I have my it. reasons. But, I, you know, I, I, I was watching the Georgia-Alabama game between my shows or between my sets, and – uh, you know, Trump, they put him on the Jumbotron. He was there with John Daly and Kid Rock and, yeah. and Herschel Walker and, and a whole list of characters. And uh, somebody posted a clip and they said, listen how bad he was being booed. And there might have been, they showed, they panned the crowd. This was a clip on social media, some progressive put on there. Yeah. And it might have been one person screaming boo. I mean, I, it, when I see that, I think, Man, I don't care about the celebrity endorsements. Uh, that was a that was eighty thousand, ninety thousand people in a stadium that were going crazy for Trump. Yes. Um, I, I just don't. I mean, like they're going to have to cheat a lot this go around uh, to make Kamala Harris likable. It's going to take a lot more than Taylor Swift and Oprah Winfrey in this yes. situation. As we head into these next couple of weeks before November fifth. You know, I think that I think the storm, I think they're going to play that to their advantage because it's going to be hard for people to get to their polling places. Uh, we have to strategize and make a plan for that. But but you in your contributor with Prager, you I, people, I, we didn't mention that, but you're very plugged in. You're, you're very uh, uh, you, you're very um, profound. I'll say that with with the stuff you put out there. It's not just Thank you music and stuff like you, you're, I mean, you are a solid thinker and that's one of the biggest things that I appreciate about you. Your commentary is spot on. What is your, what is your thoughts as we head into, do you think they're going to mount up one big cheating thing again? I'm not, I'm, I'm at a point now where I, there's no way Joe Biden got 81 million votes, no possible way. Um, and I'm pretty outspoken right. about it. Uh, you know, people, people, they were like, oh, don't talk about it. You're going to get censored. I don't even care anymore. There's no way the man got 81 million votes. They lied about that, just like they lied about his mental stability. Right. Uh, there's no way Kamala Harris gets 80 million votes. No. How big do you think they're mounting this thing? I mean, how, how stupid do you think they think, how dumb do you think that they think the American people are? I'll put it that way. You know, okay. So that specific question, I think that the left and the left regime overestimates how dumb they think the American people are. You know, mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of liberals, even something that I've been really angry about the last couple of days, a lot of liberals posting like, oh, good, the storm went through a red area. Horrible. Yeah. I wouldn't care if these were people on the right. What a terrible thing to say. I mean, that should just show right. you character because we would never say that. So just flat out, you know, they think that red red voting Americans are dumb. I'll leave it there. They think they do mm -hmm. think that. Do I think they cheated? Absolutely. There's no way that Trump got the highest um, voting amount of people if for an incumbent president and then Joe Biden beat him. I mean, you just forget even the numbers. Mm -hmm. There's no way. Um, but as we move forward and, you know, we're, we're what, 30, 35 days out from the election. Mm -hmm. At this point, their whole too big to rig thing is the gospel truth. It's got to be too big to rig. People have got to take 10 people to vote. I'm not even kidding. I you know, agree. I, I, I want to see party yeah. buses. <laughs> like that's what it's going to take because I don't think people realized how close it was in some very key areas. You know, there was some stuff where New Hampshire was super close. Um, some counties in the swing states were like 700 votes off. 
And so I think that they cheated absolutely. I think that the ballot drop boxes were a huge issue. I think cleaning the voter rolls is going to help us a lot. I think that there's some things that we've implemented on our side that are probably low publicity just so the Democrats can't undo them. You know, people keep asking me, oh, what have they changed? What have they changed? What's the RNC doing? And I think right when people think that they're not doing a lot, they're going to realize that they are doing a lot. They just can't PR it. You know, they can't go, here's where you go in order to cheat. Here's what we just fixed. Go for it. And so I think that, you know, both these sides are meeting in the middle to the things that we've fixed and the fact that people are absolutely fed up. You know, they keep pretending that abortion and, um, and, and women's reproductive rights are the biggest issues and and trans rights. They keep pretending that what I call luxury issues are the biggest issues, but they're not. It's the economy, Mm. national security. And I think that that's what's going to be prevalent for the American people, even to a 2016 level where they tell their friends they're voting for Kamala Harris and they go into the voting booth and they go, okay, what's actually important for my future? I'm going to vote for Trump. And I think that we're going to see more of that. Um, this election than we did in 2020. I think we're going to see a 2016, but everyone has to get out there and vote. I mean, truly, I still have people come up to me and say, you know, does my vote count? Um, Comments on my show, does my vote actually count? Should I go out and vote? Yes, your vote counts. You should go out and vote and we can take this thing. You're right. And and that's so right. I, I, I said from the very beginning, because, you know, our elections, that is a national institution and people lost their trust in that. And so there were people who said, what's the point? I'm not going to go do it. And I said, OK, here's the thing, guys. They, they can't turn the dial up to 11. They can only turn the algorithm up so much. Yes. They thought they had it in the bag with Hillary. They did not cheat enough. They cheated with her, but they didn't cheat enough. Uh, that's why she was so frustrated and tore the hotel room apart that night. She, had it, she thought she had it in the bag. All po- polling pointed to Hillary winning. We were all shocked that Trump won. And to your point, I mean, I didn't understand Trump back then. I voted for Trump, but I didn't understand Trump. Like I went in the voting booth and there was two boxes. One said Hillary Clinton and the other one said not Hillary Clinton. So I voted not Hillary Clinton and we wound up with Trump. And I, I, I learned to understand Trump. I got to know Trump even on a personal level. I love the guy. And so I'm like, okay, here we are. Um, you know, 2020 happened and I was like, no way he got 81 million votes. I mean, I was frustrated with that. But I told people, I said, you got to overwhelm the algorithm. If we, if it's like you said, it, it's too big to cheat, uh, too big to rig, then we can do that. And I am, I do plan to do a party bus. Uh, that's funny Amazing. you said that. We're we're gonna we're putting together a party bus. I'm gonna have a watch party that night. Um, in fact, today I'm confirming all the details on that. If people need to get to the polls, we're gonna get them there. Uh, Love and it. I, we'll come pick you up. We'll take them. Uh, And we're going to turn it into a party and then we're going to celebrate. But, you know, um, you know, Kamala, there's no way. I mean, like they just ask her. She just did that podcast with the two NBA players and they ask her about boosting the economy. She did you see that clip? She immediately started to talk about, you know, I grew up in a middle class family. She caught herself and immediately went to her sister and then talked about the lady that owned the laundromat. And it's like. What the hell is this lady even talking about? Have you tried to make, have you ever sat down honestly and just tried to make sense of what this woman is saying? <laughs> Difficult to do. <laughs> um, you know, it, it it doesn't make sense. And that's the thing. I think even if you're drinking the Kool-Aid and you're trying to agree with her, you know, I, I watched those, those interviewers um, kind of nod and look at her and look at each other. And it, it didn't seem like it made all the sense to them. Like they were really having a try. Oprah yeah. accidentally had a gotcha moment. You know, she that she accidentally walked into. Meanwhile, she's trying to have a telethon to promote Kamala Harris. You know, that even the people yeah. who are obligated to promote her don't understand her. So for regular American people, and you know what? When she has her middle class family farce, I cannot help but laugh because her mom was I forget what her mom did. Her mom was accountant or something. She did something like that was not very middle class family of her. And then her, her, dad, her mother had a doctorate. Her, her mother, yeah. I think, had a doctorate. So, yeah, exactly. And her dad is a Mar- was a Marxist professor at Stanford. You know, excuse me for 
not thinking that her middle class family thing is actually very serious. You know, they found pictures of her childhood home. She did not work at McDonald's. You know, when someone's willing to lie to you about the small things on a very basic level, yeah. they are willing to lie to you about the big things. And the truth is, you know, they keep yeah. pushing. I keep I, I keep babysitting, you know, the Kamala HQ TikTok just because I like to see what they're doing. And they keep pushing this whole, oh, Trump doesn't have a plan. He has ideas of a plan. And it's like, she doesn't have a plan. She says that she tells the same stories, the same anecdotes every single time. Her only plan is interview prep that she can memorize. And so, you know, they're clearly projecting, not to mention all of the political lawfare that's happened, of course, against President Trump and the stuff that I feel so bad that him and his family have had to go through, all the surrogates, all the people who are, you know, really suspending their lives to make sure that America is okay in the end. I feel for them because they are going through more than anyone could ever imagine um, every day and fighting that fight. And so for Kamala to get up there in her $67,000 gold Tiffany necklace and visit the border yeah. with it and pretend that she knows what she's doing, um, I'm disgusted on a personal level as an American, as someone who sees what goes on within politics. It's it's really gross. So let's, let's recount. Here's a woman who is the Democratic nominee. I, 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 I use that term loosely because she was literally only nominated by Joe Biden, nobody else. But yeah. she's the Democrat candidate for president. She's done a an interview with Stephanie Rule from MSNBC, which was pathetic. Even Stephanie Rule came out afterwards and said, "Well, she didn't answer the question." And Stephanie Rule had just been on Bill Maher saying, "Well, she doesn't have to answer the questions." I mean, she literally said that. And then she did the deal with Dana Bash, which she was chaperoned with Tim Walls. Uh, yeah. Then she did the Oprah thing, which we saw that she had a teleprompter. And then she did, now she's done the thing with the NBA players who I don't know their names. I didn't do enough research. I don't recognize NBA players. I don't care, but I, I don't know who they were, but she did that. Do you know of any off the top of your head? Are, are there other interviews that I don't, that I'm not thinking of on that? Not that haven't been thoroughly prepared or teleprompted. No, I, I can't, yeah. I can't think of anything else. I mean, she's not sitting down with just average reporters every day. She's not taking press conferences um, which is amazing to me, amazing to me. And it's also amazing to me how she never says anything, but she laughs all the time. Trump is hilarious and never laughs. Like that's a weird little conundrum. You ever That's the that? best thing about him, honestly, is he is the <laughs> funniest person, you know, on TV, in person. It doesn't matter. He's yeah. the same guy all the time. That's something I really appreciate about him. And he does not laugh at his own jokes because he's so dang funny. Um, he's and funny. I, I, Kamala could never. You know, she she just she could never imagine being that funny. I laughed so hard the other day at him. Well, two things that he said. He's caught hell for both of them. But one is when he was talking about Joe being at the beach. He goes, Can you imagine me at the beach? You know, I get a glorious body. They they wanna this is a glorious body, I've been told. And so then then it, what he said, you know, we talk about Joe being mentally impaired. He said, I, I think he became that way. I think Kamala's always been <laughs> mentally impaired. And I was like, this guy is savage. I mean, just absolutely savage. Just a legend. And, and people are going, why would he say something so mean? I'm like, well, tell oh, me where the lie is. I mean, she's she's an idiot. But But besides that, besides that, as a woman, I want to ask you, does it does it does it drive you crazy? Am it, let me rephrase the question, Alexis. Let me rephrase it. I'm better than this. I'm not going to be offended. Don't worry. <laughs> I know you won't. I know you well enough. I know you won't. I I, I just want to ask a woman's perspective. It seems to me like their only policy that they push is abortion. Like to me, that seems to be the only thing the left is running on is women's reproductive rights. Is that just me seeing that or or is that true? I think that's true. I, I think from everything I've seen, their big thing is, you know, abortion, reproductive rights, and then every shrill for the left posting that Trump's going to be a dictator. Like that's that's yeah. that's their platform. Um, that's it. I saw Hakeem Jeffries post the other day that he, he keeps posting the same thing over and over mm. and over again with different verbiage, but the same thing where he's like, you know, MAGA must be stopped. And I think I posted because I was mad that he posted that the day of the second um, assassination attempt on President Trump's life. You know, these people yeah. are vicious um, and they, you know, I don't think it's an understatement. I don't think it's an overstatement to say that they 
want something bad to happen to President Trump. But to go back to your question, I think that that's all they have. You know, they have the Roe v. Wade talking point. They have, um, they like to use the IVF talking point, which is, as we've seen from President Trump saying that he's going to make IVF free for people to have access to. It's it's not true and it's not a, a relevant talking point, but they, they know that. They'll just keep pushing it. And as a woman, I get um, I get really offended by the left, honestly, funny enough, me offended by absolutely nothing except for when the left discounts women who want to use their own brains. And I think that we're accused uh, – I see it all the time in my comments and my messages or whatever. We're accused of you know, just doing what men tell us to and not thinking for ourselves or being in a MAGA cult or whatever the left wants to throw, which is really just projection because they're blue no matter who. We actually are the party of unity where we're inviting people that we might have not agreed with a year ago. And we're like, hey, we're all in this together for America or no America. You know, we're the people who are trying to figure this out. And so yeah. as a woman, I, I do get offended. I think it's ridiculous that that's their only talking point that they have. Um, and the things that they keep saying, they keep pointing to Project 2025, which has been disavowed by the Trump campaign just on the on the fact that they have Agenda 47. That's their agenda. <coughs> you know, Project, 2020, 20, mm. Project 2025 was a think tank um, put together. And the first page quite literally says, you know, these are all of our different thoughts by different authors. They may not be congruent with one another. We may not all agree, but it's just a start to hopefully get on a better path as America. So even if you wanted to use Project 2025 as a weapon against President Trump's campaign, not only do they not own it, but it already says it's not an agenda, but they keep posting about it anyway and acting like, you know, access to reproductive health and all of that jazz <laughs> is going to be vastly affected. So I don't know. I kind of go back to my whole thing of, you know, if we're in World War III, none of the things that are involved with um, abortion or Roe v. Wade or reproductive rights are going to be things that we're concerned about if we're fighting for our lives. So yeah. it's just... And I'm glad you brought up Project 2025. I, that was the next thing I was going to bring up on that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I always want to, you know, they hold that book up at the DNC. I just want to slap it out of their hands. Um, and, and uh, you know, somebody said to me on social media yesterday about that. They said, well, Trump has mentioned numerous times in it. Well, so is Joe Biden. If you read the thing, Joe Biden's mentioned a lot, too. And who cares if he's mentioned in the thing? Uh, who cares that Donald Trump's ever spoken to the Heritage Foundation? I mean, he's spoken to a lot of groups. Um, you know, I, I've, there's pictures of me floating around out there with with different people that I'm like, well, I kind of wish that I wasn't in that picture with those people now at this point. But yeah. it is what it is. You can't tell the future. Uh, and so, <clears throat> I mean, I'm sure Bill Clinton wouldn't like to show up on Jeffrey Epstein's logs, but they did, you know. Right. I, <laughs> So, exactly. So what are you going to do with that whole thing? But but to me, the 2025 is like the Steele dossier. They found something in writing that they could put their stamp on and be like, this is what this is what we stand on regardless. And they're going to keep putting it out there. And unfortunately, people are so dumb that they hear that sound bite, just like whenever Kamala in the debate said, well, they, they trotted out that fine people on both sides lie again, and they didn't fact check her and various yeah. other things that she said. You know, they keep pushing that because they know that those sound bites are what stick in people's heads. I had somebody who's, who's a friend of mine who changed their profile picture the other day that said, I'm not voting for a rapist or a racist, and they had done it with a Scrabble board or whatever, the C and the P in the middle. And I was like, well, he's neither one of those, but you've believed enough sound bites Right. To believe that that's who that person is. And that's not who that person is. I mean, you look at the images of Donald Trump who goes to Valdosta, Georgia, and then goes to North Carolina with Franklin Graham. He's hugging these people. He's on the ground. I mean, if he was truly a dictator that hated, hated everybody and wants to you know, rule over everybody, he would not be there. He wouldn't. I mean, he the guy could have been a billionaire and ruled over his own little kingdom if he wanted to. But he chose to condescend to where we live and and be amongst the people. I, I just don't understand how people can take these little sound bites and no, create a reality when the actions are so much bigger than that. I, I completely agree. I think that, you know, they they're a party of sound bites at this point. I watched that debate. Mm -hmm. Um 
And the only thing I could think is that they're going to post all of these sound bites tomorrow on her TikTok or whatever. And that's going to be what they run on. And I actually think that that's why they ended up wanting a second debate because they realized that even if, you know, it wasn't that great of a debate for Kamala. And of course, President Trump was having to debate three people, which is incredibly difficult. Yeah. And that's why it was such a, you know, hard debate to watch because he's out here getting fact checked or getting interrupted or we'll talk about that later. And meanwhile, Kamala wasn't. And I think that they thought, you know, if we can just do one more of these debates, it doesn't matter if she wins or loses. We'll have enough sound bites to limp us along for the next month. Um, and I think that those are the things that people choose to believe. I was talking to someone the other day, maybe similar to your friend. They're they're more in the middle and they're kind of waffling. But she was saying that, you know, I, I feel like he's marketed so you know, brutally on some of these mainstream media things. And I hear these things that I know are taken out of context, but with the media that I consume and just the amount of life going on, you know, not everyone has time to dig into political Twitter or research what the truth was or research what the expanded quote was. You know, she's like, I have a hard time finding the things to disprove what I've been sold. So, you know, she was working on trying to expand the things that she consumed in order to do that. And I realized that not everyone in the middle is that open-minded or willing to look into it. But this is really a campaign of sound bites. You know, they have him saying yeah. uh, they, they try to float the suckers and losers thing all the time. That's been disproven again and again and again and again and again. <laughs> and now it's just, you know, they quote Project 2025, which President Trump's team, nor him, nor his campaign, nor really any of his surrogates, actually, that are out on the campaign trail with him had anything to do with. Um, but very similar to the Steele dossier, they don't care that it's completely made up. They knew that both of these things were made up. The only difference is they paid for the Steele dossier and they didn't even have to pay for Project 2025. So they're looking at this like free anti-marketing for President Trump. They can have a book. They can hold it up at the DNC, as you said. And, you know, they can pretend that that's what we're, we're all fighting against. But I think yeah. that's why kind of going to the middle and having reasonable conversations and reasonable arguments and and it, like I even like you mentioned earlier making videos with Prager you where someone not necessarily even on the left because I know we do get a lot of crossover there and we we we're shown on both sides but making videos where someone in the middle might say hey I actually didn't understand that and I needed that explained to me and I don't feel dumb for thinking it but hey maybe me and my suburban neighborhood where some people who are fortunate have Harris Walls signs and don't understand the peril that we might be ushered into if we actually have a Harris Walls administration you know maybe those people are waking up and I think that's going to be pivotal going back to the election in the swing states, you know, Pennsylvania, the suburban white mom is actually one of the main things because those people have been targeted. It's not their fault by humanitarian 501c3s that actually are 501c4s that try and convert people um, based on, you know, the humanitarian issue of illegal immigration and acting like, you know, people, this isn't being something that's done by, you know, drug traffickers and sex traffickers and the border being wide open isn't Harris Wall's problem. No, it's actually a Republican problem. You know, these people at the end of the day are the, are, are the victim of the things that they've had to consume over the last, gosh, eight years now. And so I think it's really getting into those issues and getting into the middle and sticking policy first and trying not to be, as you know too well, sequestered to our side of the internet and and trying to open the book on these things and, and get people yeah. to understand. How, God, you're so dadgum smart, Alexis. How'd you get so smart? <laughs> you're, you're smart. And Thanks. I... Um, I got questions. Okay, like, let's go. Okay, let me let me see if I can remember all of them. First of all, you you like myself, you you've had opportunity to sort of be in Trump's orbit a little bit. Um let's be fair. Is there is there anything is there anything about Trump that maybe drives you crazy or you wish he would do differently? This won't <laughs> be a sound bite we put out there. Let's just be honest though. Um because I think I think that's what people need to hear. I think they need to hear the fairness and there may be nothing. I'm not trying to put you on the spot with that. No, um, you know, it's funny. It's a totally fair question. And I think that this is a question that people who are being honest on the right can answer and people who are not being honest on the left wouldn't answer. And so right. for me, I think that um, on a personal level, no. You know, I've always mm -hmm. found um, 
strong men to not be off-putting, but I think that that's something that maybe um, people do find to be off-putting. Um, yeah. for Weird, me, but it's true. I, yeah, like I, I think that a lot – some I won't say a lot of women because that's untrue, but I think some women I've spoken to, they find – you know, real, real alpha strong men to be off putting at this point. And I think it's just a testament to the lower testosterone beta men that we've all kind of <laughs> been around. And I say that, you know, objectively, I think that it, it's been something we've seen them on TV. We see the dads made fun of in sitcoms. We see, you know, we haven't been around a lot of alpha male to understand the leadership and the guidance that, that is supposed to come from them, even as women, you know, and I don't mean that in a, in a, subordinate way. I, I literally mean that that's kind of the order of things. And so I think that for me, that's not off-putting. For other people, I can understand with what they're used to how it might be. Um, and to address that real quick to those people, I say, you know, at the end of the day, you don't know them personally. So you don't know, you know, you can never know how great a person is, how great they are actually when there are no cameras around to their wife, to their children, you know, you'll never know maybe. And that's okay because yeah. you're not electing a husband. You're not electing a father. You're not electing a grandfather. You know, you're, you're electing a president who's going to go head to head, toe to toe with other world leaders. And you better hope at that juncture that you have a strong one. So that's kind of my point with that. I think if I had to say anything else, it would be that when I used to watch, and I, I say this from a past point of view, because now I'm like really gung ho with with driving narrative and policy, and nothing drives me crazy ever with what he says. Because even if they take it out of sound, uh, out of context, they end up, you know, the actual in context soundbite. I completely agree with. But I used to think, you know, like oh gosh, I wish you know maybe he would have said that so it was a little more palatable to people who don't like him or don't agree with him or you know let's not right. talk about. Um, some of the fraud, not because I don't agree with it, just because it's hard for people to kind of go back on and understand if they're waffling in the middle. And I used to think of it from a from a 2024 election standpoint, you know, maybe make things more palatable. Let's be a little more gentle. Let's appeal to the middle. And not because of anything that he said that was wrong, just simply because I thought that playing politics would work. And you know what? At the end of the day, playing politics does not work because the left is yeah. always going to outplay politics because they're still willing to invite the Clintons, the Cheneys, the Bushes to the table. You know, they're they're willing to have these big conglomerate political families and play into the machines. And we're not. And that's why I'm cool with anything he says. I mean, just as a bro really broad brush stroke, but even when he says something that they try to use as a soundbite, I just go, okay, expand that, watch it. That doesn't drive me crazy anymore. I'm just like, let's, let's you know, foot to the pedal, um, get going on what our policies actually are. That's fair. I, and I appreciate that. I, I, I agree with you. You know, my only thing is like, I wish that Kamala didn't get under his skin at the debate or something like that. But other than that, what he said was he was right on those things. I don't have a problem with it. But again, you, like you said, so, so adequately and eloquently is if you can look past the stuff that, that are the sound bites or when the cameras are on and you, you see that person for how they are. Like, I love the fact that Trump was talking the other day about, he's like, can you imagine me on alcohol? How wild that would be? Like he said, I've never had a beer. And he said, can you imagine how bad I'd be if he said, I, he said, that is, that's the one thing that I did. <laughs> it's the one vice I don't have. I'm like, I, I respect that. Yeah. I respect that transparency. And I, and I laugh at it, but I appreciate that the guy is self-aware in regards to that. He knows who he is. He does. does it ever we can see, sorry, he, we can no, see. No, no, go ahead. We can see everything, you know, every every wart or spot or, you know, anything that would be negative about President Trump is something that we've already seen, not only because he's already been president for four years and we saw the result of that, um, but because he is so widely portrayed in the media in, in various ways um, that are, of course, negative by the mainstream media, that he's had a magnifying glass on everything he's done. And they had to change laws in New York and bring civil cases that could not be proven or brought as criminal cases because they didn't have anything on him. And he spent the majority of his time in New York. They could they could come up with nothing. Anything that they could drum up has already been drummed up. And so I just think, you know, skeletons in the closet scare me and I prefer them out in the open, just like President Trump has them versus, you know, the Harris Walls Biden, I don't know, Hunter Biden machine that I couldn't even begin to yeah. unpack. No, there's no way. 
And they won't let you unpack it. I mean, you, we saw how the FBI hid the laptop story during the yep. 2020 election. Now we're starting to see where there's some there's some stuff that's going on that's starting to be revealed in regards to uh, Tim Walls and his relationship to China and some of the influence there. I mean, the guy went to China 38 times for crying out loud. He did his honeymoon. Who does their honeymoon in China? I was just going to say, uh, who honeymoons geez. in China? God. And then goes back and takes, you know, high school students, class after class after class. Like, you mean to tell me that that doesn't have the intention of indoctrinating young minds, especially before he was a politician and before he got into that world? He wasn't on someone's tab to, you know, class by class, get people comfortable with, with yeah. Chinese influence? No, yeah. no way. I, people, people have no clue. You don't just go to China. I, I don't know if people realize this. You don't just go to China. Um, and if you do, um, there better be a very specific reason and you better mind your P's and Q's while yes. you're there. I mean, I've got friends who used to smuggle Bibles to China. That's under the threat of, of spending the rest of your life in prison. I mean, that in China, uh, there, there's, it's a dangerous place and he's honeymooning. I mean, go to Jamaica is Jamaica's dangerous enough. Go to the resort somewhere, dude. Get on the right. beach. Who goes to Beijing for their? <clears throat> Come on. Anyway, anyway, I, I'm looking. I'm looking at Scheider over here, my producer. He's Singaporean. He gets it. He's just Asian enough. <laughs> he knows about China. He knows. But no, who does this kind of stuff? So you're right. There's so many things that are hidden, and they're right there in front of us if people want to see it. Right. Um. I. I. You know. I caught hell yesterday for referring to Kamala Harris as a Marxist. And people are like, oh God, you're really, she's a Marxist. No, really, she is a Marxist. Look at the things she believes. Her father was a Marxist professor for crying out loud. So I've I mean, read his book. Can't hide this. I've read her father's book. Um, I saved a transcript of it because I thought that it was something that they would scrub. So if anyone wants to read it, let me know. I will send you the Dropbox link. But um, wow. it's, he believes in Marxism firmly as a solution for every problem that we might have leading into a one world government. That's what her father believes. There's no way I want, I want his the daughter doesn't believe link. that. You want the link? I'll send you the link. Please send me the link. Um, I mean, the fact that she comes out in a speech a couple of weeks ago and says, we may not all start in the same place, but we can all end in the same place. I don't, I, I don't know if people really that, like that's communism. That's yeah. that's I, that's what that is. So, but people are blind to this. But but you keep we we keep tongue in cheek alluding to World War Three. I mean, we're as close to that as we have been since the since the Bay of Pigs crisis when John yes. F. Kennedy. Uh, the, the, we're as close to World War Three as we've ever been. Uh, yeah. We're weak. I mean, when Joe Biden comes out and says, well, we've given all we can give to people in North Carolina after this hurricane and we just gave, you know, two and a half billion dollars to you. Uh, I'm sorry. To North, we've given all we can to North Carolina after this mm -hmm. storm and we've given two and a half billion this week to Ukraine, eight billion to Israel, half a billion to who was it we gave it to Singapore or somebody. Or I don't even know who we gave it to. I, it's mind blowing to me. Yeah. And I mean, imagine what the hundreds of billions of dollars that have gone overseas because Ukraine and Israel, they're not sending us any money for crisis relief, flood relief. Well, and here's the thing, you know, America is capable of being everyone's, you know, savior when we're in a good spot. We are not in a good spot. Yeah. I mean, we are ridiculously in debt. We have been for a long time. But now it's at the point where we can't even take care of our own, not just in the natural disaster sense, which is terrible that that's an acceptable thing that Biden says, you know, we've done all we can. Are we getting more federal aid? No. Do I have more faith in individual charities than I do federal aid or even, I'm sorry, but the Red Cross? Yes, I do. I mean, the people who are flying in helicopters, those are the people that I want to give my money to. Um, I know that Trump just started to go fund me. I know that they're probably going to try and shut it down, but I think that those resources are going where they need to go. Um, as far as being close to World War III, mainstream media does not talk about geopolitics as much as they need to. Aside from headline, you know, we've sent this here, we sent the National Guard here, and they're kind of even being mum about that. You know, they're, we're not getting everything that we need to. And I think what people really need to understand is that the Biden administration, the Biden-Harris administration has teed up the rest of the world to go to war 
almost intentionally. And I say that yeah. because, you know, we had the failed Afghanistan with just a brief, you know, brief walk down history. We had the failed Afghanistan withdrawal, which left them equipment. Now, I think what people don't understand is, of course, we left people there. We left contractors there. We left people who were locals that were helping us, that we said, hey, we're mm -hmm. Americans. We're going to take care of you. We did not take care of them. We lost 13 men because of it, injured many, many, many more with the Abbey Gate um, whole disaster. And just the whole withdrawal was a failure. I mean, just, you know, like failure. There are, pro there are um, protocols when you withdrawal from a place where if you can't take the equipment with you, that you either dump fluids into the engines, you destroy it. You destroy the helicopters. You make them at least unusable for the people who might take them over. We did not do that. We left them for Iran, for China, and now they actually have taken that equipment because now that they have it, they can bring it anywhere they want. They have it now. So they have billions upon billions of dollars worth of equipment. And then, of course, the United States unfroze funds to give directly to Iran. You know, Iran was broke under President Trump, and now they're thriving. They're working working on a nuclear program. And now instead of preventing all this from happening, the Biden-Harris administration has prioritized potentially reinstating the Iran nuclear deal. And so all of the things that kept us safe, you know, this pathway, one could look at this in a linear fashion and say, wow, I think they actually want us to go to war. And I don't think that's a really harsh accusation because I think that's exactly what's happening. So now you have, you know, we're allies with Turkey. Turkey is a part of NATO, but Turkey is partners with Iran and Ayatollah and everyone. I mean, and they are attacking Israel, another one of our allies. You know, it's just... It's a bunch of things that should not be happening, that people that we should not be partners with in that sense, people who actually hate us. Um, the ambassador of Turkey, I don't think people know this, the ambassador of Turkey, I forget his name. I'll look up his name and I'll post it later so people can go see, just endorsed Kamala for president. I mean, these things yeah. are not all happening by accident. And I think that, you know, while that, sorry for the long-winded tangent on why we are actually close to World War III, but these are pushpin at this point. I mean, it, it's 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 right there. Um, yeah. And I know that Zelensky met with Kamala and she said, oh, Ukraine will win this war. And then Zelensky meets with Trump. And of course, you know, Trump just says, we're going to make peace happen, which I think is the appropriate um, assessment of what's going on. Because you can't say, oh, this person is going to win. <laughs> we can't even guarantee the U.S. is going to win at this point. They need to stop yeah. it. And I fully believe, along with others, that Trump will have that resolved before the inauguration. I like you get him elected, he'll have that taken care of before he even takes office. Um, and and you didn't even mention Xi Jinping of China or Putin in Russia. So your your assessment of that is completely accurate, and that's just one of three major fronts that we're dealing with right now. Right, it's a frightening situation. I just want to go back to singing country music and telling jokes. <laughs> you know, I, it's it's crazy this right. world we're living in. I know it's crazy it. this world. Do you worry as a woman? Another question as a woman, because I have three daughters, right? And, and I worry all the time because yeah. they're off doing their thing, their careers and, and living their lives and doing great. D d do you worry about these Venezuelan gangs that are out there, the threats of violence? The I mean, we get a report from the director of ICE that says 663,000 that have been released waiting processing are convicted criminals, 13,000 of those convicted of homicide, 15 to 16,000 convicted of rape, 1,865 that are awaiting homicide convictions. Um, do you worry as a woman just to live your life in, in the United States of America anymore? I do. I mean, I, I carry, I think that, you know, if yeah. you, if you're trained with a gun and you understand, I don't know, can I say gun? Cause we're on YouTube. Yeah. Um, if you're trained with a firearm and you have the will to carry, then you probably should as a young woman. I mean, I, I think it's smart. I think at this point, um, if the people in charge aren't going to protect us, we have to protect ourselves and I think it's very scary. I think it's realistic that people should be concerned about this. You know, you have states that are not border states um, that have become border state crime level uh, states. Mm -hmm. 
And so I think that at this point, you know, I'm worried about myself. I'm worried about, you know, looking down the line. I want to have kids. Is this a safe world to bring them into? I mean, for real, right. people are worried about reproductive rights and all these hypothetical things and to to dissuade people from having kids. But I'm worried about having kids. You know, I think that sure. we need to really think about that um, as far as and I know we can protect our own families. I really do believe that. But I think that it's it's a crazy time right now. And I think the next month is going to be really important to see where this whole thing goes. Ooh, that's a mouthful. Hey, can I just say to all of the 25 to 35-year-old men that are out there that happen to be listening to or watching this show, if you're considering a relationship in life, I want you to hold out until you find an Alexis Wilkins, <laughs> okay? Just hold Thank out. Yeah. <laughs> just hold out until you find somebody like Alexis. I'm telling you. Um, you are so good. And, and, um, I appreciate your voice so much. Do me a favor. Thank you. First of all, for the time. I, and I, I want to explain to the audience, I had to postpone you like three times because <laughs> of my schedule kept changing and I apologize. It and I never, good. you know, I do apologize. Thank you for being patient with me. I've been looking forward to this conversation and anybody that's watched this or listened to this knows why. Um, how can people help you find you, support you, follow you, go see you, what are all the ways that people can be fans of Alexis Wilkins? Well, I appreciate it. So I am at Alexis Wilkins on every you know social platform you go to, Instagram, Twitter, True Social, you know, all of that. Um, I work with Prager. We post videos on there trying to help people understand the issues. So, of course, if you follow Prager, you'll be able to see more of those videos. I've recently started posting some videos on um, TikTok, actually, which I was never a big – TikTok gal, but I realized that you can get to, um, like I said, crossing the aisle, get to people in the middle that way. So I am on TikTok yeah. at Alexis Wilkins Media is my political account. Um, and then I have a show called Between the Headlines over on Rumble, and I think it streams on Twitter as well, but mainly Rumble, where we recap the news every Friday um, in 15 minutes or less. So we try and go over things. We do a narrative correction segment for um, as we touched on earlier, anything crazy that's taken out of context, we go over it, we expand it, we look into it, we make sure that that's not what happened. And all of the time, it is not what happened. So we do that. We do a constitutional bit. Um, and so I do that every single week. So you can go catch that on my Rumble channel. And and go download her song. Uh, don't stream yes, it. Yes, you can do that it. too. You, you can, you can yeah. download the music. I have a song called um, Country Back, which we're uh, playing a lot right now because we're in the home stretch of this election and I need people having it pounded into their heads that, you know, I want my country yeah. back and we're all in this together. So you can go watch that yeah. video, um, both on rumble and YouTube and stream the song as well or download it. Now you're right, Chad. I appreciate that. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. And it's a great song Thank and you. you're a great talent, a great voice. And I appreciate you. Thank you for your time. Um, Alexis Wilkins, everybody. Um, if you weren't following her already, now you need to be, and you know why. So thank you so much. Um, thank you. guys, I want to encourage you to go grab my new song called Watered Down, uh, with my friend, John Rich singing harmonies on the chorus with that. Uh, it's a fun one. And it's also very profound and relevant to the days in which we're living. Uh, and go to watch chad.com, the most vain web address on the planet. It sounds like an OnlyFans. It does. It sounds like an OnlyFans. Watch chad.com or you go to chadprather.com. Uh, but I'd love to see you out there on the road. And uh, who knows? Maybe I can twist Alexis's arm at some point in time. We'll get my band together, her band together. And we'll do a show together somewhere. Hey, we'll I would love have fun that. With it. I would love That'd that. Cool, I think it? I talk about that a lot too, that like, the people who are on the same page, you know, getting to real people in America, you know, we, we just need to do our own thing, put on our own shows. Yeah. And I think people would, I think people would really respond to it. And I hope that they would come and hang out with us and gosh, we'll get to talk about music and politics. I love it. I know we'd have fun with it. We'd have fun with it. All right, guys, follow Alexis. And uh, meanwhile, leave us the ratings, leave us the reviews and uh, drop me a line, chat at the Chad Prather show dot com. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, until next time, we love you. God bless you. And we'll talk to you then. Bye.